Mountain bike technology is developed at a frankly astonishing rate. Each year new products and suspension designs seemingly pop up from nowhere. Or do they? Now if you take a look at pro racers bikes, that is where you're going to start seeing the new mountain bike tech emerging. Sometimes at races you'll see the stuff shrouded in mystery, other times you can see it hiding in plain sight. So if you want to be seeing what's coming next in the world of mountain bike tech, you've got to be looking at the bikes of the world's fastest racers. In this video we're going to check out some of the coolest tech we've seen emerge in the last few years from the race scene all the way through to the shops where you can buy the stuff. Okay, so firstly then, we're gonna jump in and we're gonna look at the SRAM access system. Yeah, that's right, that is their wireless shifting system, electronic and wireless, the first one in the mountain bike scene. Uh, seems like witchcraft, doesn't it? Absolutely crazy on paper when you talk about this stuff. So SRAM has a program called Black Box. They use it with their transmission, they use it with their brakes, and of course they use it with the rock shocks suspension units, the forks at the front and the shocks at the rear. If you see the Black Box decals on any professional racers products, you know that that is a prototype. Uh, and it's in work, like working in progress, and it may, may well see production down the line. Now we'd seen the rumors about some wireless shifting stuff coming from SRAM, and you kind of figured it was gonna happen sooner or later in mountain biking, given what was going on in the road world with the red equipment. Now, the first time I actually got to see it in the flesh was at the Stellenbosch World Cup in 2018. So that's in South Africa, and it was the first round of the XCO World Cup. We found out that he had a set on his bike, so we were desperate to get up to him and have a look. So I snapped some of these pictures, as you can see, of him in practice. Uh, we were allowed to shoot the race, and we were allowed to shoot in practice, and things were a little bit different now. But I managed to get these pictures and we could desperately trying to see what was on his bike, but nothing. And every time we got close to him, he disappeared. Finally, we did catch up with Nina and his bike just as he was going into the Scott Mechanics tent. He basically took the shifter off so we couldn't see it and he showed us the bike. He wouldn't answer any questions about it. He would just look at us with a little wry smile at the corner of his mouth. And he told us that we were not allowed under any circumstances to touch it. So I filmed a short piece on it. In fact, you can see some of the footage on screen. If you want to see a link to that video, it's underneath this video. And of course, not being able to touch it, you just want to touch it more, don't you? So we had a good look at it at the time it was bearing the black box decal. In fact, you can see that right on screen right now. And it was super interesting. And what a way to launch a product. Having the number one racer, Nino Scherzer, with that product, which has yet to be proven, at the opening round of the World Cup. So all eyes were on Nino in the race. And it was one of the best races I've ever witnessed. In fact, it was the best race I've seen in the flesh. But the race was all about Sam Gaze versus Nino Scherter. Now Sam basically got the lead into the arena with Nino and he pipped him on the sprint finish. Now in that sprint finish, speculation says Nino actually had a failure on his gears, but that's not what I believe happened. Now, firstly, there was no way that Nino was going to beat him anyway because Sam got into the arena before him and he's a strong rider. So he was controlling when that sprint was going to happen. And Nino basically was along for the ride. And if he could match it, he might have got close, but we'll never know now. What I actually think happened was as he came around that final turn, in fact, there's a series of images here that I shot, I was here and I didn't hear any gears skipping at all. What I think happened was as he was over the front of his bike, giving it all of that characteristic Nino shirt of power, he basically, his back wheel looks like it skips momentarily on a small bit of debris on the ground. It could be a rock or something. This is the shot. Look at his left foot. It's clipped out and his back wheel is actually off the ground. I think that he hit that and basically it just threw him off momentarily as he was under power and just pulled his foot out of the pedal. Either way, he didn't win the race, and it's really annoying um, from his point of view, I'm sure, but Sam, what a worthy winner because it was an incredible race. However, this was the start, and this meant SRAM Access was here to stay. All the time, we just knew it as the Black Box, uh, Black Box Eagle, I think we referred to it as. Now, the next time we got to see it was at another XCO World Cup, this time at Nova Mesto. Now, this was incredible because we went to see Yannick and the Scott team again, and he greeted us this time. This was great. And he goes, here's the bike. You can see everything. Um, I'm not going to ask uh, any questions this time, though, because I don't know a lot of the stuff that you're going to want to know. But here's the bike. Just please don't touch. And never in my life have I wanted to play with something so much. I wanted to like go through the gears and give it a try. But 
myself and Dan, the cameraman, we were really respectful. We did our jobs, we just looked at it, we took all the images and the photos, and we delivered the bike back, and they were really thankful for that. Uh, and that was good because then SRAM came to see us when we got back to the UK and they showed us a full pre-production set and I got to try it out finally. And it's astonishing. Um, I was blown away and, and still am blown away by the performance of Access. And at some point, I definitely want to set it on my bike or at least to spend some good time on it because I think it's incredible and it most definitely is the future of shifting for racers. But that's a, just one example of a great product that we saw pre-production being used by the best of the best racers to refine it and make sure it works before it sees production. Okay, next up is another shifting based one, but this time not from one of the big manufacturers like Shimano or SRAM. We're gonna talk about TRP and Aaron Gwynn. Now, when Aaron Gwynn started the YT mob, there was a lot of speculation about his interesting choice of sponsors. And the fact there was a lack of sponsors as far as transmission goes. There was no SRAM in sight and there was no Shimano in sight. So when he was spotted at an early downhill race with this weird looking shifter, something clearly in prototype formation. There was a lot of speculation on the brand it could be. We heard box components reference, we heard micro shift reference and also E13. After all, E13 was one of his sponsors on the YT mob and they were making a downhill cassette. So it's logical, right? Well, it wasn't them. It was actually TRP, his brake sponsor, who he helped develop an astonishing downhill brake with. And he was gonna do it again with the downhill shifter and a derailleur. Now, the really interesting thing about this is it does have something very different to all other derailleurs on the market. So yes, it has a clutch design on it, has a ratcheting clutch. In fact, you can hear the noise of the clutch if I just move this one now. Very distinctive and it's very, very powerful, which is exactly what you want on a downhill bike. But something about Aaron Gwynn that I didn't realize until I was told by the TRP technicians is apparently he hates noise on bikes to the degree that sometimes he's raced and ridden using earplugs. So he's like just locked out from all of that noise so you can just focus on the job at hand. So one of the things he wanted was the derailleur to be completely silent and for no chain slap to be sort of present on his race bike. And the way they got there was quite interesting. So the B-screw, if I just hold this derailleur up for example, where the derailleur mounts onto the bike here, you have the B-screw and this adjusts the height of your jockey or the guide wheels in relation to the cassette. But once it's adjusted, it doesn't actually serve a purpose after that. And the derailleur can actually pivot backwards and forwards on that point, but there's actually no need for that. So with the TRP technicians and Aaron Gwynn's race mechanic, John Hall, they invented this, which actually locks this part of the derailleur known as the B knuckle. It locks it. So you make the adjustment, you lock it, and the upper part of the derailleur cannot move at all. So that in combination with a clutch derailleur that's immensely strong means a completely silent bike. Now that is really quite cool. You also might notice that the one in my hand is actually a 12-speed trail derailleur. It's much bigger than the downhill ones and it hooks up with their shifter. So it goes to show that you can get some trail stuff that's gonna suit all of us. It comes from downhill race development. Again, looking to the races for the development that you're gonna to start to see filtering down to what you can buy in the public. It doesn't necessarily mean you're only gonna be able to buy a downhill product just because a racer is using it, but they will always be developing it. And you'll find the same happens with suspension. You'll see a lot of technology from downhill suspension that's taken through into trail bikes and of course into cross country bikes. But hey, TRP, Awesome stuff, an awesome bit of development there from Aaron Gwynn. Okay, next up is about a set of carbon fiber wheels. Now this is a particularly cool one because we're gonna talk about the Zip 30 Moto wheels. Now Zip, in case you don't know, are really famous in the road world and in the tri world. Um, essentially for making aerodynamic products. In particular, they're famous for their dimpled profile rims. They've got a slightly dimpled texture even on the rim itself. Imagine like a golf ball texture. And it's more aerodynamic because of the way the air sticks to it and enables it to pass through without disturbing the air. Uh, incredible technology. But when Jerome Clemens and a few other racers on the SRAM portfolio running SRAM, well, RockShox forks and shocks and SRAM transmissions and brakes, 
we're seeing using carbon wheels. Everyone kind of thought, oh, that's going to be the new SRAM enduro wheel or perhaps even a downhill wheel. Neil actually spotted the wheels under Jerome Clements at the Andes Pacifico race. Uh, and he was pretty sure that they were SRAM because of the colors on the wheels. They were basically black, but there's hints of red about them. And they fitted perfectly in with that, but not so. Now, a bit about the construction of these wheels that makes them so special. They have two things that really you've got to take into account. There's the single skin design of the rim, which comes directly from motocross, where they build a big, heavy duty single skin rim. They don't need to make it lightweight because you've got motors to power the things. In mountain bikes and road bikes, you tend to have a, a twin skin rim. So it's a hollow form, basically. Um, it gives it rigidity, yet you can use thinner material to make them nice and light. If you're going to run a single skin rim, it's going to end up being very heavy. And this is where carbon fiber comes in. So I've taken the concept from a motocross bike and they're using the carbon fiber technology the Zipper experts in. And they've made a super lightweight rim. But you can get carbon rims that are actually too stiff. And the result of that is A, they don't grip as well because they can actually ping off things rather than conforming slightly and absorbing some impacts. And the second effect is they can be really uncomfortable and transmit too much shock through to your hands. Now, the really cool thing about the zip wheels here is the fact that they have something called ankle flex engineered into them. If you, feel, you think about walking on a section of rough terrain, your ankles will naturally conform to the terrain. Therefore, you're not going to slip or rebound off stuff. You would just naturally move along. It's exactly the same concept on these rims. And in fact, I made a video with Blake with these exact wheels in. And if you want to see that, it's going to be in the description underneath this one. Uh, if you don't know about these wheels, you should watch it. It's really good. And you get to see Blake on a motocross bike as well. But this is another cool example of how you see and stuff being tested at the most extreme races where there's not exactly a big presence of media. They're there under watchful eyes, of course, but, uh, but there you go. All the way through to production. Very cool stuff. Okay, next up, I want to talk about the Santa Cruz V10 29-inch wheel race bike. Now, this is a really cool story because of the fact that 29-inch wheels, they're not exactly new. 29-inch wheels have been around pretty much since the beginning of mountain biking. It's just there wasn't a good source for tires and it wasn't the right source for rims and various other factors stopped them ultimately being one of the sizes that we might have seen the whole time through mountain biking. Instead, we used 26-inch from the start because it was readily available. Might have been the wrong move, but we'll never know. Now, Greg Minard, you could argue the fact that he was been riding a bike far too small for most of his career. And it's taken him up until 2016 when he started to ride a double XL frame on 27 and a half inch wheels. And he really started to get back into his stride again. You think of a guy that's been racing an awful long time compared to some of the youngsters out there and he's getting faster still. And the correlation is the fact that bikes are getting bigger and longer and Greg Minard's getting faster. So the logical choice was for Santa Cruz to pursue this and look into the 29 inch wheel thing. So bear in mind that this had come up in the early 2000s and disappeared. It came up again around 2011, 2012. Uh, one of the bikes that did that was the Norco Shinobi, which I've made a video on. You can see in the link underneath this one. Uh, I'll give a bit of history about the 29 inch wheel in that as well. And then of course it started to come in again in around 2016, 2017. So the Santa Cruz team got themselves some early Maxxis sample tires. They got the Envy rims. They got the Fox 49 fork. They had new back ends made up, new linkages to, to cope with the length of the back end to make sure the shock's not going to get overworked. And they basically ran them on existing 27 and a half inch front ends to do some prototype testing. Lucas Shaw, Loris Verger, and Greg Minard were testing in various locations over the winter, including Finale Liguri. And they all found the bikes were universally faster and they weren't bad like they thought they were going to be. They all started thinking actually there is something in this so they decided at that point to commit to it and they became the first team to turn up at the first World Cup at Lourdes in France uh, in 2017 with three 29-inch wheel bikes and three races. They'd fully committed and you could already see a lot of the other teams were starting to sort of scratch their heads and look and they're like do they know something we don't? Well it appears they did because they got a first, a third and a sixth in qualification. Unfortunately, the heavens opened and it was a notoriously sippy track and I think everyone just managed to nurse their bikes downhill. However, that qualification round was enough for all of the teams to start panicking and all the designers backstage were all starting uh, getting their design heads on and seeing what they could bodge together to get 29 inch wheels in the existing frame. And it's kind of funny really because Santa Cruz did it right. They spent their time doing testing, they were methodical about it, their bikes had got longer previously, they started doing it the right way. And obviously now that they knew that this was going to work, they started to work on the front end of the frame. And actually the 29 inch version of the V10 came much later, but a much more refined looking bike. And of course it's available now and you can set it up in an MX 
situation as they, they're calling it a Santa Cruz, which means the Emma motocross style where you have a smaller back wheel and bigger front wheel. Uh, some people call it mullet. Now, Lucas Short and Lois Verge are sticking to 27.5 on the rear and 29 on the front. Uh, Minar is sticking to the 29 front and rear because that's what works for him. Uh, but I think it's super cool that Santa Cruz committed to this. They've made a series of amazing videos. Some of them are going to be in the description underneath. You can watch this. And I just think it's brilliant that they had all of the other teams just basically clucking because they suddenly missed the beat here. Um, and they actually it made it worse for the other teams when they all started trying to make cobbled together 29 wheel bikes. And the riders weren't like weren't with it. They, you can't just adjust like this. These guys have done proper structured training uh, around this and has worked with Fox suspension to get everything dialed in. But uh, super cool that the bike is around. And this is a shot of that latest bike on screen. Now, another manufacturer that always has its work cut out for it is Maxxis. Now, they launched the Maxxis as a guy tire and a bit later the Dissector tire. Um, they were Greg Minot and Troy Brosnan's choice of tyres. But the interesting thing with any tyre manufacturer is they've really got their work cut out because as bike technology gets better, wheel sizes get bigger, they've always got to have the tyres there to suit them. They've got to have the tyres that can enable the bikes to ride the terrain that they're designed to ride and at the speeds they're designed to ride them at. You think how much things have advanced since 26 inch wheel downhill bikes compared to 29 inch wheel downhill bikes. Okay, so a good bike rider can still go extremely fast on 26, but the courses no doubt have been getting rougher and as a reflection on what the bigger wheel bikes can do. As a result, no one can go that fast if they can't keep their bikes stuck to the ground. So the tire manufacturers really have their work cut out. Now, Greg Minar has been particularly finicky uh, in the best possible sense. He's a perfectionist and he knows exactly what he wants from his bikes. Now, he'd been a long-term fan of the High Roller 2, uh, but he'd also used other tyres like the Shorty and the Mini and DHF and DHR2 over the years, trying to cobble together the right sort of combination of feel, grip, traction, rolling resistance, uh, that sort of stuff to suit him on different courses. Now, there was a tyre that he wanted that wasn't currently in the range. So this is where the Asgai came from. Now, the Asgai name, by the way, interestingly, is, uh, is some kind of uh, Zulu spear. So uh, I guess hailing from Greg's hometown there near Peter Marisburg. Now, really cool because the tyre actually takes features from all of those tyres I mentioned. It has a slightly deeper tread that you see on the shorty, something that is really needed on the super rough multi-terrain courses you're seeing now. Uh, you know, quite often having rock, roots, mud, sand, water, everything all at once on a racetrack. You've got to have a tyre that can really kind of deal with most things. And there's elements of both the DHF and the DHR2 in the main centre tread there. So it kind of combines four tyres there to make really the ultimate tyre. Now, iterations of that tyre were seen on various different Max's test rider team bikes and we've seen on Greg's bike. Well, although the tread design didn't appear to change, you can be sure that there were other changes made. The casing would have changed, the inserts and protection put into them to make them suitable for downhill would have changed. The rubber compounds would have been experimented with. They would have softer compounds generally for the more competition-based tires. After all, they haven't got to last. They've just got to be the maximum grip and purchase for a race run uh, compared to a consumer tire, which quite often made of firmer rubber that's gonna last longer. Yeah, there would have been lots of different factors at play there. And a company like Maxxis, they're always rolling, they're always changing what they're doing. The dissector is favored by Troy Brosnan, had a lot of input into that tire. Largely as a rear tire, it can be used as a front, but uh, I believe he uses that one mostly on the rear, but the same principle involved. Looking for tires that had elements of other tires that wasn't quite there, trying to pick little bits and pieces from tires. That's not what we're talking about in this video. This was all about that particular tyre that Greg Minar developed over a couple of seasons of racing. It took two seasons to develop that, to get it from prototype stage being ridden out in the field to where you can buy that tyre now. Super cool stuff, that. Uh, next up is a personal favourite of mine, despite the fact I don't actually have one, is the Cannondale Lefty Ocho. Yeah, so that's the single crown, single leg suspension fork. Now, if we skip back to the lefty when that was announced to start with, it was a bit of a crazy concept. Imagine having a single leg fork on a bike. Sounds crazy, doesn't it? Literally half a fork is just not there. Um, how can it possibly be stiff enough? Well, look at motorbikes. You quite often see that approach on the rear ends of motorbikes. And we've seen it on the front end, to be fair, as well. You see it on the, uh, the undercarriage of a lot of aircraft on the landing gear. And technically with your car, with the way the axle, it's a stub axle, the same concept, although it hasn't, it's not suspended from an arm like that. Um, you're seeing this all around the world in different applications. So it's not that strange. It's just looks very different to the norm. But rumor has it, uh, the approach of it is kind of cool how it started. So Canada had a twin leg, a regular downhill fork. So a twin crown, twin leg fork. 
And it was universally known as the stiffest fork on the market. And the reason for this was it had four sided stanchion tubes on them. And on each side of those stanchion tubes, there were 88 needle bearings going up and down. So the thing was extremely slick. It wouldn't have any binding, any friction or stiction in the system. But because it had a square leg with the bearings, there was zero movement. And it was so stiff that the mechanics on the race bikes, I think they pretty much joked that, oh, you'd, you could probably do away with a leg. And I think essentially they bodged a hub onto a single leg that took one of the legs off and tried it in the car park and it worked. And that really was where the lefty was born. But skip forward to 2018 and they blew everyone's minds away again where they released a single crown version of it. Now, I'm probably not alone here in thinking that the only way to make that fork stiff enough was by having it a twin crown design. Uh, so you've got the support from the head tube of the bike to make the leg long enough to house a leg long enough on the inside to have those four sides with all those bearings. But they made it they made it even less basically. It took off the upper crown, the up, upper leg on it, so it became a single crown, and it didn't have a four-sided approach, it had a three-sided approach, as you can see on these video clips here. Um, an absolute work of art, really, as a as a technical uh, piece of engineering. It's just just astonishing. Yeah, as you can tell, I'm, I'm still blown away by them, how they work. They feel amazing, they look, in my eyes, they look amazing. Some people really struggle with the look of them. But the coolest thing is they were race proven long before they came out and were they announced in 2018. Because of the fact that Cannondale, quite crafty with this, they 3D printed some plastic fake upper crown units and they had them on team bikes long before this. So they were race proven, they were out there being raced, but no one knew because it got to the point where you didn't look at left anymore because you knew they work, you knew they're out there. But uh, and then 2018 came, got rid of a bit of plastic. Oh yeah, by the way guys, here's our single crown fork. Amazing. Um, I love Cannondale, I love what they do, always have done. I think they're amazing. So keep an eye on what Cannondale do because they've always got interesting tricks up their sleeve. Okay, and the last super cool piece of tech I wanna talk about that's come from the race world is the Trek Super Calibre. Now, I love my XCO race bikes at the moment and this, I've got to say, has got to be one of the very best looking bikes of all time. I mean, look at that. So the shock unit, the ISO strut system is a structural part of the frame. We'll get to that in a minute though. Now, Trek have had seriously cool and lightweight race bikes in the past. You've had the top fuel full suspension bike, and you've also had on the hardtail bikes the ISO speed decoupler system, uh, which is effectively a way of enabling the seat tube of the bike to be dampened slightly, so you could still pedal a, a hardtail over choppy terrain. Of course, when you stood up, it doesn't matter, you don't need that feature. Um, but that was super cool, but on a hardtail, they needed to redevelop their suspension bike, and they've done that with this bike. Uh, as you can see on screen, it looks amazing. It's a brand new bike, it's a 2020 bike. Um, um, it's on the market right now, you can buy this thing. Um, but it was first seen and it's already been race proven um, under the capable uh, feet and arms, of course, of Yolanda Neff. So that's where it's first seen at Novi Mesto, which is in the Czech Republic, um, one of the rounds of the XCO World Cup last year. And look at the bike, it looks amazing. And it had this crazy shroud on the top tube there, covering up what could only be a shock underneath. Now, looking at the back end of the bike, there was no pivot. So either a flex state or it was a hardtail, but if you look on the non-drive side when she was riding past or racing past at speed, you could see it had a pivot point there. So we knew it was a full suspension bike, you just couldn't see how the bike was working. The bike was ridden for the whole season and it was at Monson Air where they finally took the covering off so you could actually see the bike and that was probably the official launch date of it. And it had this insane shock technology designed by Trek, built by Fox in conjunction together. And it's a structural part of the frame, so very different from other suspension bikes. So the, two, the shock is in two parts. You've got the stanchion tube is actually mounted to the top tube, and that is completely solid. Then you've got the carriage, which is basically a carbon fiber, carbon fiber carriage that slides over the top of that, and that is part of the rear end of the bike. It's part of the seat stay. You have your seals that actually push into that, and you've got the bushing unit inside that rear part of the bike that slides over the rest of it. Now, as a result, it's a very lightweight and a very stiff system, but it's also got a few other cool things up its sleeve. It can be ran fully rigid, so it does feel like a hardtail and it's light as a hardtail too. But also the air spring can be linear or it can be very progressive. So you can have it feeling like it has more suspension than it actually has for the choppier courses, or you could run it really quite progressive for those where you just need that little bit of sting taken out of the tail, but you need the bike to feel nice and punchy. I think Trek are on it at the moment, and I think this is a super cool bike. And I love the fact it was race proven long before you could buy the bike in the shops. Now, all of this tech I've shown you, no doubt is very expensive, but you've got to bear in mind, just like with Shimano, like we've told you earlier in the year, the tech comes in at the top, comes in at an XTR level and it filters down to the SLX level. This is the same with all bike manufacturers. They all have to work 
in this way because it's the best way to develop the stuff at a cost that they're gonna get a comeback and gonna get a return on it. So you think all of this cool technology, you will start seeing this on cheaper bikes down the line. Uh, quite exactly what all of that's gonna happen, I don't know. Uh, but there's loads of other cool stuff out there. Of course, we saw the Fox 38 being used, or at least a Fox Fork with a bizarre shaped arch that we now know the 36 and the 38 have that on them. And we've also seen the RockShox Zeb come out of a race background as well. It's super cool, there's always cool stuff going on, so make sure you keep an eye on any upcoming races to see what those pro racers have got bolted to their bikes because it's pretty sure you're gonna see something that's either current or something that's not so current that might be forthcoming down the line. Now, I'd love to know what you think are the most cool parts that you've seen in this video. I'd love to know what your favorite race parts are ever that have been developed, maybe an old Boxer 151 black box fork from back in the 90s. Um, literally anything, uh, let us know what you think and um, well, thanks for hanging around and hearing me talk about all the cool favorite tech I've seen at the races. Now, as always, please don't forget to subscribe to our channels and give us some love in our shops as well because we've got loads of cool kit around at the moment. We're launching limited edition stuff all the time. See you later.